Good morning. This is Nancy Hiltz. I'm the orthopedic clinical specialist at the Kaplan Joint Center at Newton Wellesley. And I'm going to be joined by Dina Murad, one of our senior physical therapists and pre-op coordinator. And what we hope to do is just walk you through the whole experience of having hip replacement surgery. Certainly it's different than live. These are different times. We want to assure people that the hospital is a safe place to come. Um, there's a lot of precautions that have been set in place for COVID prevention. One of the things that you'll see is that your healthcare team and you will be wearing a mask while you're here. Your healthcare team may also have glasses or a, a shield on while you're here as well. Um, if you have any questions about COVID or COVID prevention, you know, feel free to ask any of the healthcare team members. Dina and I this morning are in a private room so that we will not be wearing masks during our presentation. So when you come in to see a surgeon with hip pain, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to do some x-rays because what they're looking for is healthy hips versus arthritic hips. And I'm going to show you the difference with models as well as x-rays. So on here is a healthy hip. Your hip is a ball and a socket or a ball and a cup. It's one of the most mobile joints in your body. When that joint is healthy, the ball, which is the top of your thigh bone, your femur, and the socket have a protective covering called articular cartilage. When that's healthy, it allows the hip to move freely without pain. Unfortunately, that type of cartilage has no blood supply and no ability to repair itself. So as we put wear and tear on our joint, that cartilage cracks, frays, and will eventually wear out. And that's what this picture is depicting. Here you see there's no space, that the cartilage here shows up as space. Here there's no space. And when you get that bone on bone stress, you can also have bone spurs or osteophytes little reactive bone that forms that can further restrict your motion. So your surgeon's gonna take one look at this and say, mm, it's time. You know, there's nothing more that we can do to treat that conservatively. And the recommendation is going to be for a total hip replacement. So what do they do with a total hip? So in this model, my bony model, you can see the ball and the socket. There's also a capsule that's a blend of fibrous tissue and ligaments that surrounds that joint. It's one of the things that holds the ball in the socket. It's one of the things that stabilizes it. It also has a special lining called synovial tissue and that secretes fluid, helps lubricate the joint. During surgery, they're gonna open the capsule to gain access to that bony anatomy. But at the end of surgery, they repair it so that you still have that capsule in the synovial tissue and synovial fluid in the joint. So what they're going to do with you under anesthesia in your happy place, they're able to pop that ball out of the socket. So then they have access to both sides of the joint. And what they're going to do on the femur side, now in this model, all of the clear is your own bone. They make it clear so I can show you how the prosthetic is going to fit into it. So they're going to take off that diseased femoral head. You have a canal that goes down the center of your bone. In these pictures, it's the lighter area. And what they're going to do is they fit this stem snugly right up against the wall of bone. There's a special texturing at the top of it that's a mineral found in your bone. And your bone cells are always turning over. We build up new ones, we break down old ones. So as they remodel, they're gonna grow right into the surface of that prosthetic, and that's called biological fixation. It's one of the things that's increased the longevity of the prosthetic. So what sits outside your femur is the neck and the ball. This ball happens to be metal. There's also ceramic balls. And your surgeon will choose what prosthetic he feels is best for you, your level of activity, your anatomy, 
your pathology. And they're happy to explain that to you when you see them. On the cup side, now again, this, all of the lucite here is my pelvic bone and they're showing how this cup is going to fit into your bone. So they clean out all the disease cartilage. There's a thin metal shell that goes right up against the wall of bone. It has the same texturing that the bone cells grow into. Mine is a demonstration model. So there are holes in mine. Those are screw holes. Sometimes the surgeon will feel he'd like additional fixation and they'll put a screw into the bone. Inside of that shell fits a plastic liner. And this liner is made out of cross-linked polyethylene. The cross-linking is a manufacturing process that's increased the wear strength. And that's important because it means that you can have more years of activity on it before you get real wear and tear. So now I'm smooth on smooth. So that groin pain, that knife-like pain, that pain down your thigh is gone. We substitute stiff, achy, and tight after surgery is usually the way that people describe that discomfort. And the nice thing is post-operative discomfort gets better. You know, you'll see, as crazy as it sounds, as you get up with your physical therapist and nursing staff and move, it really helps with the stiffness that you feel. It starts work in those muscles and helps your body reabsorb the fluid. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. <coughs> Allergies. It's just like when I give class live. So as part of getting ready for surgery, once you make the decision and you get your surgical date, we're going to have some pre-op testing that's going to be done. So you will have a history and physical done in your surgeon's office. Sometimes they'll have your primary care do that history and physical. And then you'll receive a call from our pre-test um, You'll also get a call or a, a virtual visit from Dina, our pre-op coordinator. She'll talk more about what her role is in helping you get ready for the after surgery, knowing what's going to come. So once you complete your pre-op visit, the next time we see you will be the day of surgery. And they do ask you to be at the hospital about an hour to two hours before, but your surgical scheduler at your physician's office will give you that information. We are testing everyone for the COVID um, test preoperatively. That'll be part of your pre-op preparation. They're also having you use an ointment that prevents staph. The Mer we were testing for MRSA. Now we're treating everyone for MRSA because we've switched and we're testing for COVID and we don't want to do too many nasal swabs. So you'll get that ointment as part of your pre-op testing as well. The day of surgery, when you come in, someone is going to need to drop you off um, at this point, and we will keep you abreast as things change. Um, family members are not allowed to be in the hospital with patients. So I usually suggest to people, if you want to keep your cell phone with you until you go over to surgery, you'd be able to communicate with them that way. But you'll be brought up to the pre-op unit. There, they'll change you into your hospital attire. You'll see your surgeon, you'll see the team of anesthesia folks and whoever's going to assist your surgeon will be over to visit you as well. They'll start an intravenous catheter where we give you fluids, medications. Um, you know, your surgeon is going to confirm the surgery to be performed. It's called site verification. So they're going to ask, so what hip are we doing today? Even though they know the answer. And they're going to put their initials on the hip that's going to be done. When you get into the operating room, you're going to be sedated. But before surgery begins, your surgeon actually pulls the entire team, anesthesia, nurses, and everyone will confirm what side and what procedure is being done. It's called the pause or the timeout. It's one of the safety measures that we have in place. I remind people that your surgeon is your captive audience. So if you have any last minute questions, feel free to ask. 
when your anesthesia team comes over, they're going to give you some pre-op medication. So we give everyone a Tylenol, a Lyrica, and a Celebrex, three pills and a little cup of water. All of those block pain in a different way. So by having them circulating in your bloodstream, it prevents the pain from rising as high. So you'll get that right before you go over to surgery. When it's time to go, they take you right on the stretcher bed. Anesthesia will bring you over. It's literally through the double doors. And on the ride over, they're going to give you some sedative medication. So most people never recall being in the OR. But what happens is that you go into the OR, you move from your stretcher bed to the operating room table, anesthesia is administered, and surgery is performed. When your surgeon is finishing the surgery, when they're closing that capsule, closing the incision, they inject a little cocktail of medicine into all of the soft tissue that has Novocaine and anti-inflammatory medicine. And that's proven very, very helpful in the after surgery. You're, they're putting that inflammatory medication and that Novocaine right in the soft tissues. And the soft tissues are really where most of the pain is generated after surgery. So sometimes people wake up in the recovery room and feel pretty good because of the Novocaine, but that Novocaine will wear off. And then you'll know exactly what you're dealing with. Also, people can have what we call breakthrough pain. Even though there's numbing juice in there, sometimes people have discomfort. All you need to do is communicate with your nurse in the, in the post-anesthesia care unit, alias recovery room or PACU, and they will have medication available for you. So when surgery is complete, the dressing that's put on is called Aquacel. It stays on for seven days after surgery, and you'll get all this information and instruction after surgery as well. So your move from the operating room table right into your hospital bed, and then the whole hospital bed goes into the recovery room. So when you awaken in the recovery room, you'll be in bed, you'll be on your back, you will have oxygen. Most often it's that little nasal cannula, sometimes it's a mask, and they keep that until you're fully awake take a good deep breath on your own. They'll have a little clip on your finger that actually tells us how much oxygen is getting to your bloodstream. You'll still have that intravenous catheter going in. We'll give you a dose of antibiotics before surgery and then two doses after surgery. And that's just, just part of our standard infection prevention protocol. After surgery, you'll have the dressing. You may have elastic stockings on. And then you also, will have these wraps around your calves that inflate with air once a minute. And they just help with circulation. When you're resting in bed, not up walking, that squeeze helps shoot the blood back up to your heart. It's one of the ways that we minimize any risk of a blood clot forming. So we use those leg squeezers. Your therapist is gonna get you up and moving really quickly. And then we also will have you on a blood thinning medicine. If your only risk for forming a blood clot is the fact that you've had hip surgery, you will be on a baby aspirin twice a day for six weeks. If you had any other conditions that increased your risk, you may be on a stronger blood thinner, like a Xeralto or um, Eliquis, but your surgeon will make that determination before you go into surgery. So most people spend about an hour, two hours in the recovery room. They'll want your blood pressure stable, alert and oriented, comfortable, and then you move up to the nursing unit. Most of our patients are just with us a night after surgery. And it's a busy time because we're going to get a lot accomplished with you. But what guides the boat for your discharge is really your safety and independence. Prior to leaving us, we want you comfortable on whatever medication you're on. We want you to be able to get in and out of bed, on and off a chair, walk 150 feet with your crutches or walker, do stairs if you have stairs at home, and understand your activity restrictions and your exercise program. So those are the tests that you have to pass before you leave us. So that afternoon or evening of surgery, you get back up on the nursing unit. They're going to progress your diet. We have the dietary service has a little room service type arrangement. So you call down when you want your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it magically appears, and they're able to accommodate any kind of dietary restrictions. 
um, usually you get back up, have something to eat, and then you might rest a little. If you're done early in the day and you're feeling well, your blood pressure is solid, no dizziness, lightheadedness, you may see your physical therapist. And Dean is going to go over that in detail. But if you're later in the day, or maybe I was a little lightheaded and it's now it's eight o'clock at night and I'm ready to get up, it'll be one of the nursing staff that gets you up for your first walk. And you can put as much weight on that operated leg as you're comfortable with. And Dean is going to talk a little bit more about that. As far as managing your discomfort after surgery, we use a multimodal approach, which means we use a bunch of modalities together. So first, we use a lot of ice that helps with the swelling and the discomfort. You'll be on a medication called Toradol, which is an anti-inflammatory. That goes in your intravenous every six hours for the first 24 to 48 hours. You'll be on extra strength Tylenol three times a day. Often people say, oh, Tylenol doesn't do anything. And sometimes as alone it doesn't, but it helps other medications work better. And then there'll be a stronger pain medication. Often our hip patients do very well on tramadol, which is a narcotic, but not an opioid. So that that will be available. Some patients do require an opioid, which would most often be oxycodone. But your nurse, your rehab staff, your PAs, the physician assistants, everyone will be quizzing you on how you feel and will work with you to find a medication that works best for you. And that will be the medication that you get discharged with. Now, all of the narcotics and opioids are very constipating, so we'll have you on medication to prevent constipation during the entire time that you're taking that narcotic. Um, you shouldn't be afraid to take pain medicine. You won't need it long, but we want you to be in a good comfort zone because then you're able to participate in your physical therapy better. You will get a paper prescription when you leave the hospital for your narcotic. If you need a renewal, you can call your office and the offices have the capability to electronically send it to your pharmacy. So you would just call and talk to the nurse practitioner or the PA in the office and they would assess what medication you need and they're able to electronically send it to your pharmacy. So the I always warn people the first night is not a restful one. The nursing staff is in quite a bit, checking your blood pressure, your temperature, making sure you have enough fluids and well hydrated, your antibiotic gets hung, your Toradol gets hung, they're checking on your pain. So people frequently tell me in the morning that it wasn't a very restful sleep. So day after surgery, if you haven't seen physical therapy, you're going to see them. The other member of the team that you'll meet is the case manager. And you may even meet the case manager the afternoon of surgery. And their role is to assist with discharge planning. The majority of our patients are able to return directly home and we send in home services. A nurse comes in a couple times maybe to look at wound care, make sure you understand your medications. But most of the work that you have at home is with the therapist. And Dina, again, will talk about that. But the case manager will ask if you have used a home care agency. If you have and you like them, they'll consult them and they make all the arrangements, send all the necessary paperwork so that when you leave us, you'll know who the home care agency is and when to expect them. We do ask our home care partners to be in the day after you get home. There are some people, because of their level of functioning, that require a stay in an extended care facility. Um, we prefer people to go home for a number of reasons. We think they're happier in their home, in their own environment. Um, certainly, it's one less exposure, but safety is what guides that boat. And if you do need that extended care, again, you're your physical therapist will speak to you about it, your nurse and the case manager will help with those arrangements as well. When you leave us, you get a whole packet of information with all your discharge information, medications, wound care, who your home care agency is, when the sutures come out, when you see your physician back in follow-up, what things would a physician's office wanna be alerted to promptly. And all of that is reviewed with you, your therapist gives you instructions on your do's and don'ts as well as your exercise program. And then we keep a copy of that in your chart. So if you have any questions when you get home, then you can 
give a call to the physician office. Um, when you're ready for discharge, you know, your family will have been contacted. They just come into our circle and one of the staff members will bring you down and get you settled. Um, if you have a long ride home, longer than an hour, hour and a half, you might want to plan to get out at a rest area or just walk a little so that you don't feel as stiff when you get out. You know, if you're sitting for two hours, all of that swelling kind of sits in the same place. Doesn't hurt anything, but you're just going to be a little bit more stiff when you get out. Um, the other thing is when you get home, crash. Get on the couch, ice it, and take it easy. It's a lot of activity in a short period of time. It's not unusual to be really tired the first couple days home. It's very normal as your body is adjusting. So we give you permission to crash and just take it easy that first afternoon, evening home. So that's kind of my piece of this. I'm gonna turn it over to Dina and she's gonna to speak to all the fun that you're gonna have with your therapy department. All right, so I'm going to try to make me bigger so let's see if I can do that so it's not loving me too much all right slightly bigger so um so yes I'm Dina I am one of the physical therapists at Newton Wellesley Hospital I also work as um, a pre-op coordinator so as Nancy sort of alluded to earlier um you may meet me on, um, you won't meet me, sorry, you used to meet me, <laughs> um, but um, you'll be receiving a phone call from me um, preoperatively to sort of chat a little bit about what your home setup is like, what your current mobility status is like, and um, so that we can best plan for your upcoming admission here at Newton Wellesley. So, um, from a physical therapy perspective, we are involved with all our total joint patients. We see our patients starting um, usually the same day as surgery, as Nancy again alluded to, if your surgery is sort of earlier on in the morning, we'll most likely see you that afternoon um, to start to get you up and moving. And if not, um, you will still get up and moving with the nursing team, but you'll see the physical therapist the next morning. Um, after surgery. So that first PT session is really designed to do what we call an evaluation. So it's really assessing all of you. We will confirm your home setup details, we'll confirm your prior level of function, we'll confirm what support systems you will have in place for you at home, um, and then we'll assess how you do moving in bed first of all. We will assess your upper extremity strength and range of motion in addition to your non-operative leg and then obviously your operative limb. Um, so we will make sure that everything is working the way it should be and that um, you know it is not unusual that the first time you go to move your operative limb it's feeling weak, heavy, um, those are all completely normal sensations. Um, and, and it's partly because as Nancy mentioned, you'll have some swelling in the area that interferes with how the muscles operate in the beginning. Um, so that's part of our assessment. While you're laying in bed, we'll also go through the home exercise program that we will be teaching you. This is just to simply start moving that leg they're very basic the majority of the exercises are done in a laying down position um, and then you know we will tailor the number of repetitions based on your ability um, and some exercises you'll be able to do till the cows come home some are a little tougher and we'll give you clues and tips on how to make those easier um, once we're ready to start moving, we're gonna check your blood pressure in the laying down position. We'll check your blood pressure, your heart rate. Um, and it's important for us to monitor your blood pressure and your heart rate when we go to move you around, because that is how we can tell how your body is responding to the position changes. It is not unusual the first time that you may go to get up that you may feel dizzy or lightheaded. Um, your body has gone through a lot. So 
uh, through surgeries. So it's important for us to sort of keep an eye on how your body is responding. When we teach you how to get up to the edge of the bed, sometimes you'll require assistance. Sometimes you may be able to move by yourself to get yourself up to a seated position. We'll instruct you how to do that safely. Once you're in the sitting position, we will recheck your blood pressure and heart rate to make sure that your body, as I said, is responding the way it should be. So lots of blood pressure checks the first time you go to get up. You'll be ready to donate us your arms. Um, so how, you know, how your blood pressure responds will also dictate how much we do with you. If your blood pressure drops, we may decide that it's safer to go back to laying down and trying this a little bit later, once you've got some more fluids into you, once you maybe have a meal in your body, that might help with that blood pressure response. If your blood pressure is stable sitting up at the edge of the bed, we will progress into a standing position. Um, we start every patient off on a walker the first time they go to get up. And as Nancy mentioned, we do anticipate you will be allowed to put full weight through your operated leg as you can tolerate. There's usually no weight bearing restriction. Um, we'll teach you how to safely use the walker, getting up, using it. Um, once we have you into standing, if you're not dizzy or lightheaded, we're gonna start to take some steps. Again, how far you go will be dependent on how you're feeling, how your blood pressure is responding, those sorts of things. I always sort of say, you know, do not be disappointed if you don't get past sitting up at the edge of the bed the first time you go to get up. Um, everyone does a little bit different. Um, you'll have some patients that are walking the hallways and some patients who might just stand at the bedside or just get to the sitting position. Ultimately, everyone gets to the same point for when they're ready to go home. And as Nancy mentioned, we're, with therapy, we're working towards those goals for going home. So from a PT's perspective, we want to make sure that you're independent with getting yourself in and out of the bed. Um, we want to make sure that you can get yourself up from a seated position into a stand using crutches or a walker. Um, we wanna make sure that you can walk a minimum of 150 feet, again, using the crutches or the walker, and that you can climb the stair setup that you have to tackle at home. Um, whether it's stairs with a railing or stairs no railing, we're going to train you on whatever you have to do. Some patients might have equipment at home like crutches or a walker, and that's great. Um, if they are, if you know they're already set up to your size, I would say um, at this point, don't bring them into the hospital, but have them ready for you in your car for when you're ready to transition home, because you'll need them. We have equipment in the hospital that is uh, clean and will be available for your use while you're here. Um, if you don't have that equipment, we will provide you with crutches or a walker, whatever you need for transitioning home safely. Okay. Um, so if you have the equipment though, and it's not fitted to your size, bring them in with you on the day of surgery. Um, that way it will be tagged in the pre-op area with your name. It will come up to your room with you um, and the physical therapy team will ensure that it is fitted to you correctly prior to you transitioning home. Okay. Um, so that's really everything from a PT's perspective. For the most part, as Nancy mentioned, most patients are able to meet those goals for home within 24 to 48 hours, the vast majority within the 24 hour time frame after surgery. Um, and obviously, if some patients need a little bit more time, we will have those discussions with you, the case management team, and the healthcare team as a whole, so everyone is aware of what your needs are. The occupational therapy team, you will also work with them while you're here in the hospital. They work on the tasks of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, um, getting in and out of the shower, taking care of your personal hygiene. 
they are important because you will have a set of motion restrictions for usually after surgery. Um, depending on the type of approach your surgeon has, uh, does in order to do the hip replacement, um, you may have a set of restrictions. The most common one is what's called posterior hip restrictions. Um, what those mean is the first restriction is we don't want you bending your operated hip greater than 90 degrees. So I'm going to bring up some pictures um, to bear with me and hopefully I can better show you on a picture rather than me just explaining it. So there we go. Let's see. Ta -da. Okay, so it's going to take a minute for it to load, I think. Sorry. Um, I'm going to stop share for one moment. I'm going to pause the recording. So as I promised, um, here are some pictures of the motions that we do not, uh, would like you to avoid doing. So the first restriction is, is we do not want you bending your hip greater than 90 degrees. So what does that mean to you and I? In this picture, we don't want you bending over to pick something up off the ground. We don't want you, while you're seated in a chair, leaning forward to put on your shoes and socks. And if you're in bed, we don't want you leaning forward to try to pull your bed covers up, okay? So that's, the, that's one of the most important restrictions. And, and here you can see the correct way to do it is if you needed to pick something up off the floor, you may use what um, my colleague Dave has in his hand, what's called a long handled reacher. Um, you can pick something up off the ground, or if you're picking something slightly larger off the ground, you'll be able to kick your operated leg out behind you. So you're keeping that hip nice and straight as you lean forward. Also, when you're trying to get up from a chair, it involves you scooting your bottom forward to the front of the chair and then using armrests to be able to push yourself up from the chair rather than leaning forward, which you may traditionally do. Um, the next set of restrictions, what we want you to avoid doing is rotating your operative leg inwards. So if you're laying in bed, we want your kneecap and your toes pointing up towards the ceiling. We don't want your knee rolled inwards. Um, so you can sort of see Dave, his left side being the operated uh, limb. We don't want him rotating that toe in position in a standing position. Um, or if he's seated, we don't want that knee to be pulled inwards toward the midline position or if he's bringing his leg across the bed, rolling his knee again in towards the middle of his body. Um, and then, you know, people say, when do I ever really do that? Most people have, you know, feel like they're restricted in this position preoperatively. And I say the biggest time frame when patients might rotate their leg inwards actually is if you're standing with your uh, operated limb planted on the ground and you go to, to twist towards that side. That's when you may be uh, doing that positioning. Um, so. The last restriction is, is we don't want you crossing your legs. So imagine your body has a line down the front of it. Um, we don't want that operated limb crossing that midline position in a laying down position, standing position, or a seated position. We just don't want you doing that, okay? So demonstrating the correct way to stand, sit, and lay in bed. Some patients, if you sleep on your side, um, the best way to avoid doing that is to put a pillow in between your legs. Um, that will be really helpful. 
um, to help minimize your risk of um, crossing that leg over the midline position. So, um, so those are your restrictions. So the big key is, is now that you're at home and you're able to prepare for coming in for surgery, some key things to look out for. Check out the heights of your chairs that you sit on at home. When you're sitting on a chair, you don't want to be sitting in a low seat, that when you're sitting down, your operated leg is higher than the level of your hip. So your operated knee is, we don't want it higher than the level of your hip. So the most important place to look at is your toilet as well, toilet seat height. So um, if when you're sitting on your toilet, if you're operated, um, if your knee on your operated side is higher than your hip, then it's too low and you're gonna need a raised toilet seat. We are not a fan of the types of raised toilet seats that attach directly on a toilet bowl, just because we've had some experience where they don't always fit correctly and we've had patients, unfortunately, tip and fall as a result. What we generally recommend is getting what's called a commode. So it's what you would think is a portable toilet, um, but simply what you would do is take the bucket out and put the frame directly over the toilet and it has adjustable legs. I'm going to show you a picture of what I mean. And we recommend you getting one of these in advance of surgery. So again, going to pull it up. And Dina, if I could just add in, you know, these precautions that Dina is going over are the posterior precautions. If your surgeon uses an anterior approach, you may not have precautions, but a lot of these things that Dina is speaking of, height of toilets and seats, just make it easier to get in and out of um, when your muscle strength isn't the same. That is 100% true. So um, as you can see, this is what I'm talking about. It's a commode. You can take the bucket portion out and put the frame directly over the toilet. It has adjustable leg rest to make this uh, height higher based on your baseline height. Um, and we can give recommendations for what your setting should be while you're in the hospital. But um, by far, God love Amazon. I feel like I am a walking advertisement for them. They are by far the cheapest place that you can find them. Um, this is pretty much the same type of commode that we use in the hospital. I think it's the exact same make. Um, and it runs at around $36.95. Um, and, and really, there, you can look up if, for example, you're a gentleman, you might prefer a slightly wider commode, and you can look up the dimensions and things, um, so that way you can purchase a commode that is best suited for you. Um, I, as I mentioned, we recommend getting this stuff prior to you coming in for surgery, as um, getting all this equipment set up will make your transition home a lot easier. So that's the first piece of equipment. The other things that we recommend getting is what's called a long handled hip kit. And in this hip kit, it has all the equipment that uh, you will need for dressing. It has that long handled reacher so that you can pick something up off the floor. I know they're demonstrating it by picking something off a top shelf but um you know if you dropped a pen or your glasses on the floor that will give you a way to pick that up without having to bend over it has what's called a dressing stick and this is a stick that has a hook on the bottom um, and the purpose for that is it will help with taking things like your socks off without having to bend over a long-handled shoehorn to slip your foot into a shoe, a long-handled sponge again that you can bathe your lower body without having to bend over. And this blue item is what's called a sock aid, and that helps with uh, getting your socks on, and the occupational therapy team will show you how to use it to get your socks on your feet again without bending over. And then patients always tend to ask, what's the best type of shoe? We recommend a shoe that has a back to it that's flat, not a heel, um, and 
some patients will get sort of the athletic slip-on type shoe that still has a back to it and that's fine just expect that sometimes your foot can be a little bit swollen initially post-surgery so something that has a little give um, if you have sneakers sneakers are great we would switch out the sneaker laces for one of these laces these are elastic shoelaces this turns basically any tie shoe into a slip-on shoe so um, you can bring in the elastic shoelaces with you if you want us to switch out the shoelaces for you prior to going home. Other than that, I would keep the kit at home so it's ready for you to use once you transition home. And again, I would recommend purchasing that prior to coming in for surgery. Unfortunately, insurances don't tend to cover these pieces of equipment anymore. And that's why we recommend you know, you purchasing them yourself um, prior to surgery. A lot of medical equipment stores will sell this equipment, um, but I think honestly, the cheapest place that I have found it, you know, is Amazon, but you can purchase it wherever you feel comfortable purchasing that equipment from. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna come back to you. There we are. Okay. So, um, so that's really it from a PT and an occupational perspective for while you're in the hospital. And as Nancy mentioned before, we're going to set you up with a physical therapist and a nurse to come to your house upon discharge. Um, generally, Nancy mentioned the nurse is in there once, maybe twice a week, monitoring your wounds, making sure you, anything medical that needs to be monitored is, is going the way it should be. PT is going to be progressing your exercise program once you're at home and starting to transition you off the crutches or the walker down to a cane to, or one crutch to eventually nothing at all. I say that the home services are great for about two, two and a half weeks. Um, and then we generally would like you transitioning into an outpatient world for physical therapy. So it is a good idea now to, again, preoperatively to start to think where you would like to go for your outpatient PT. Once you know where you'd like to go, um, just let your um, physician's office know so that they can fax a prescription or provide you with a prescription um, so that you can start to pre-book those outpatient visits. I will give the disclaimer right now, just with um, the current uh, COVID situation, that your outpatient uh, therapy may be a combination of some in-person PT sessions and some telehealth, but your primary um, outpatient therapist will assess what is the most appropriate care for you based on one, how you're presenting and doing, and two, you know, obviously what your long goals, long term goals are and um, where you are in regards to your recovery. So, um, you know, so just anticipate that that might be a bit of um, what your outpatient recovery might look like. So that's really it from a PT's perspective. I'm gonna turf you back over to Nancy and um, she'll continue from there. So, um, as Dina said, you usually transition from home care to an outpatient setting. And most often you're seen back in the physician's office at four weeks for your first follow-up visit. You know, the, all of the offices want you to call if you have any questions or concerns during that time. Um, you know, I know that outpatient therapists, home therapists are great about reaching out to physician's offices as well. Um, on the Kaplan Joint Center website, um, if you go on to nwh.org, you can find the Kaplan Joint Center and there are educational booklets available in a very reader friendly format. There's also my contact information so that if you have any additional questions or concerns, you can email or call me. Um, I will be happy to share Dina's information if it's more physical therapy related. Um, we just hope that this gives you an idea of what to expect when you come in. Um, you know, your healthcare team throughout your experience is going to be there to answer any other questions as well. But we just want to give you kind of an idea of what's going on as 
we wish we could do it face to face, but we're hoping that this is fills in the gap for right now. So thank you for participating.